In the early months of 2011, Queensland was hit by what history will no doubt judge as perhaps its worst period of natural disasters since white settlements. Typified by Toowoomba and the Lockyer Valley's terrifying inland tsunami. The city of Toowoomba is effectively split down through the main centre of town. Two women have been swept away in the city centre and emergency services earlier tried to rescue a man and a boy clinging to a lamppost. in the vehicle managed to get out of the car onto the roof of the vehicle. However, uh, only one of those persons was able to be rescued before the vehicle and the other persons were swept away. I just said, Mum, I've got to go. I love you. It's rising. I don't think we're going to make it. This is my family here, my wife, two daughters, my two grandsons. We thought we were going to die. second aircraft did 15 winches as well last night. The most horrendous thing I've ever seen in, in 25 years of flying. It's just unbelievable. Really deeply traumatised, but very grateful for us to come down and get them out. They're my customers, but they're also my friends. So there's going to be a memorial here for them. We'll never forget them. As we weep for what we have lost, and as we grieve for family and friends, and we confront the challenge that is before us, I want us to remember who we are. We are Queenslanders. We're the people that they breed tough north of the border. We're the ones that they knock down and we get up again. This program will look at how Queensland and Queenslanders have fought back. We'll be looking at not only the monstrous and costly physical challenge, but also the daunting emotional challenge faced by direct flood victims and their families the rescuers and emergency service workers, the clean-up teams and even the councillors themselves. We'll look at the mistakes made and the lessons learned as we face the undeniable fact that this has happened before on varying scales and will happen again. Join us now as we journey around this vast state as Queensland does what it does best, fights back and wins.
pushing people to their limit, you know. It's just totally, totally heartbreaking. I knew she'd come up one day, but I didn't think I'd see it like this, though. You get settled and you get happy. And this happens. Queenslanders, mate. Everybody's got a ton of guts and the will to fight back. It's tragic when you look at the, the sadness in their faces as, they, as some of these people know they're going to lose their prized and personal possessions. Undescribable. What do you say? What do you do? Anyway. Queensland, there are dark days still ahead, but Australia is standing with you. One million megalitres, or two Sydney harbours, flow into the Wyvernhoe catchment every day. Prepare and begin to experience the worst natural disaster in our history. Uh, sleep last night and the main reason was thinking about the pain and suffering of people across Brisbane and how we were going to help them. Underneath every one of those roofs is a family. Underneath every single one of those rooftops is a horror story. It's really restored my faith in what's, what everyone can do to help. I mean, it's just been incredible. There's been people we don't even know in our house that have just come in and just totally cleaned it. Just amazing people you don't know, you just walk up to them, say hello, and what do we do? And it just everybody bogs in, they just do it. Coming up next, the task we faced as the waters receded and with the sleeves rolled up and teary eyes dried, we set to work. Perhaps the only thing that matched the speed and ferocity of the flood water that hit so much of the state was the speed and tenacity of the clean-up operation and recovery. From Brisbane's much vaunted and for the most part well-organised mud army, often quietly and largely behind the scenes in communities and districts around the state, volunteers and emergency services got to work and with a speed that makes the head spin, turned mud-splattered and dispirited communities into places where you'd swear water had never been. A perfect example of this was devastated Grantham, where the priority was to clean up as fast as possible for both health and safety reasons. The grim search for victims and the simple morale of the community. However, even here, lessons have been learned. It's really the start. It's the start of a lot of work. And, you know, I think we all have to consider that what we, what we knew at Grantham was, you know, the culmination of probably 150 years of development. And to go back in and put things back as we want them to be in a matter, a matter of weeks or months is impossible. It's really the start of a long, hard process. I think the, the, the mental impact is everything because I think people need to you know, develop a positive way forward if, uh, if they're being too depressed by what they see and where they live. Uh, it's very difficult for them to start the rebuilding process and I think that's why it's so important that we remove all the, of the, the debris and all that sort of thing early in the piece to make it as pleasant as possible during the rebuilding process. A 
lot of counselling will be necessary because there's some horrific situations people have been through. And uh, I know even now uh, the memories that must be coming back are, uh, are devastating for them. The important thing for people to understand about this disaster that's occurred here, I think it's beyond what most Australians would even have a concept of having happened. Done a shift, got home, put my head down, door knocked on the front on my door and said, Dad, there's water coming over the driveway. I got downstairs, started lifting stuff up. I was thinking, oh, it's not going to come high, but by the time I started lifting stuff up, it was up to here. And it was straight to the roof, guys, we're going to the roof. Just ripped the awning off the back veranda and up, got all the kids up on the roof. And couldn't even hear yourself talking. It was just, just the power of it. You're seeing the houses across the road coming towards me, house on the corner smashing up against another house. These houses just taken off down the paddock, people screaming for help. We were picking babies and children out of windows because the house was just jammed with logs and sticks and cars and just no escape. Everyone was locked in their houses. They couldn't get out unless someone was outside to pull stuff off to get them out. It was just, it was, yeah, it was crazy. When you see it in person and you experience the aftermath of it, the, just the sheer quantity of debris piled up against houses and what's left of houses, um, and the smell and the heat and the snakes and everything else that was looking for safety as well. Words just cannot describe what those people must be going through that have experienced that firsthand. Seeing houses smash up and people cling to trees, you know, it's hard. It has long uh, lasting ramifications upon families and the healing process is a very long process for them to come to terms with. So yeah, they go into the, into the disaster with history and, and sometimes that just adds to their sense of loss uh, at this time, at, at this disaster that we're experiencing now. Lest we forget. Absolutely, yeah. Sorry, lest we forget about our town. We're a small town. We're one of many that have been hit by this really, really hard. And please don't forget us, you know. It's, no one knew where we lived before. I liked it that way. I like that it, it's a quiet, sleepy town of close-knit people, and no one even knew how to spell Grantham. Now everyone knows where it is for the wrong reasons. I want it to go back to the way it was with that community feel and everyone knows each other. Still, life, work and recovery must go on. And within a matter of only a couple of weeks, even fields that had previously been under metres of water were being ploughed ready for a new crop. An enduring symbol of spirit and hope. All the while, work on repairing shattered infrastructure proceeded at a breakneck pace. Here at the historic Spring Bluff railway station, Thankfully, itself spared. The shattered causeway was well on the way to being rebuilt. Reopening the vital lines from the giant grain and coal resources of the Darling Downs. In often searing heat and humidity, contractors and railway workers put their strong backs, hearts and souls into getting the job done. Coming up, the pivotal role the giants of Queensland industry have played in getting the state up and running again. And later, the king hit of Cyclone Yasi in far north Queensland.
There's often mistakenly a belief that recovery ends when people walk back into their homes or workplaces, when in fact that's where it begins. While the timber and tin, the gyprock and bricks can be replaced in months, it will take years for the memories to heal. Bundaberg hardware store owner Jason Metcalf, a man who's built his life around his business, family and community, is typical of the raw emotion. As it was sort of happening, it was every inch of water that came in the shop was just a, another extra day and days and days and days. And obviously when it got to filling up, we knew how much work we had to do to rebuild it. Once we were able to get in, it is emotional and it is financial. But the shining light of, of a bad situation was the community help. On the first day, we had 70 people just walking in off the street. Uh, we had the next day 80 people walking off the street. Um, people that don't know each other now working together. Digging through here, I mean, we had silt and mud and slime and chemicals and paint. Three days after it all happened, I think I calculated 12,000 12, working hours. shouldn't be upsetting. <laughs> it's, I'm proud, you know? So. <sighs> this is the sort of grief that will take years to overcome. But the spirits remain strong, even though sometimes the tears flow freely. Such is the case of Ipswich Mayor Paul Pazali, as in the first few weeks, he surveyed the devastation of the once pristine college's crossing. The thing that's kept me going is being able to talk to people. And that's why I have to make sure the people who are, are devastated that say they're OK, that they're not really OK. They're actually feeling it inside and they just don't know how to express it. That anger, it's when they realise that they have to rebuild totally. That's when the media's gone, when everybody's gone, and we as a community have to put in place the mechanism to deal with that. And um, does it worry me? Yes, it does. Um, and we're going to deal with it? Yes, we are, because um, we have to deal with it. But I can say that the, the community is, is just, it gives me the energy that I need. Am I fragile? Yeah. Do I show it? No, I can't afford to. My role as being a, a civic leader is to demonstrate the leadership that is required during this devastating time. And when I go home, I can be Paul Pasali and have my cry. The toll on local community leaders was immense, as typified also by the Mayor of Rockhampton, a city which is no stranger to floods. My engagement with this community has been one of extreme positive support, extreme uh, keep going, Mr Mayor, um, and that's made my task uh, a little easier. It's made me work a little harder. The thing that I was always conscious of with my public message is that there were some wonderful stories of camaraderie, light humour, people making the best of a situation in true Aussie spirit. Here again, the spirit of local business people, like a man whose brand new Riverside restaurant, Spinnaker's Bundaberg, copped a hammering, makes your heart swell. We only did a complete rebuild nine months ago when we first took over the business. And that was massively stressful. And in this circumstance, to go through it all again in such a short period of time, definitely been times where I thought that it would be easier to walk away than go through the struggle of trying to get it back up and running. The amount of support that we've got from people that we know, people that we don't even know, has given me a lot of strength and determination. Well, they could see that we were struggling and they did everything they could to lift us and make sure that I've got a bunch of lunatics here helping me out and they, they kept their spirits up and, the, and um, during that period and I think, that, I think that that's one of the things that you have to do to be able to keep going because if you don't you're a chance of falling on your backside really. I'm very determined and, and I'm very confident that we're going to bounce back from this and do very well. We've got some changes that we're going to make. I think we'll be bigger and better than what we ever were. Yeah. There are some who say that when Mother Nature takes it into her mind to go on a rampage, she's unstoppable. But tell that to Queenslanders. With an eye to the ultimate recovery, 
They turned their homes, properties and businesses into inland atolls. Using superhuman efforts and gangs of friends to build giant levee banks to protect individual dwellings. They, however, still face the mammoth task of rebuilding miles upon miles of destroyed fences and replacing years of priceless breeding stock. In one extraordinary effort, an entire motel complex in the middle of town. Larger than life, Emerald motel owner Paul Pittman has vowed and declared his refurbished property will never go under again. And his solution, whilst not cheap, is innovative and shows every sign of working. Let's let him tell us his plans. We're not prepared to go through another flood like this again. So we've constructed a wall that's 1.4 metres above the last flood level. It's a fill wall and it's braced every four metres. We believe it'll, it'll hold out the water. So we're trying to uh, make sure there's no weak spots in this wall. And uh, we've only got one entry, which is at the front, which we'll, we'll sandbag up at the time and uh, put, a, uh, put a plywood uh, sheeting across. And that'll be the only weak spot. And in addition to that, if we get any water in, we've got a big pump, we call it Bertha. Big Bertha. But this, this wall should handle a, an Armageddon type flood, which we hope we never have, but you never know. So, not gonna go through this again. Couldn't go through it again. So we're gonna make sure we don't. For dozens of shires and councils, the bills are huge. Just look at this giant sinkhole at the end of a Toowoomba road bridge. The council says they simply have not got the resources to fix it. So, until some arrangements can be made, it will remain a festering sore. Back in the middle of Toowoomba, it was just physically impossible to prepare for the speed of the flood. And the topography and age of some of the buildings meant, like this grand old hotel, they're quite literally having to be restored from the ground up. But just across the road, at a major local furniture retailer, already it's back to business as usual, after what they call the giant storm surge swept through their premises, causing untold damage and literally washing expensive stock down the street. To look now, you'd be forgiven for thinking it never even happened. And that's the story we encountered all around the state, as Queensland moves with astonishing speed to rebuild, restock, and where possible, get back into business. The message is clear. We are back, we are here, and we are open for business. A message you hear right around a battered and bruised, but far from beaten, Queensland. No government's ever faced a, a bigger task in the history of this, uh, this state. It, it's enormous, it's almost daunting. This is a marathon, this is not a sprint. This is going to take a long time, a strong commitment and a lot of organisation. And uh, We've got to keep the people who have been out there generous of spirit, continuing to be generous of spirit. Because when the smell goes, uh, people seem to forget about it. We don't want people to forget about this. We're going to need a mammoth effort to, to really get people to continue to focus on the needs of others here. We're going to have a lot of needy Queenslanders for a long period of time. We're putting the stake in the ground and this community will put the flood behind us and we will move forward. We'll have some wonderful initiatives and uh, through our council resources and our council responsibility, we will certainly make sure that we have a planning scheme and a long-term plan for this community that will make this achieve its goal of being the most livable region in the world. Let's take a step back in time now for a moment or two to the days during and immediately after the flood and cyclone events, when the immediate priorities were sheltering and feeding the thousands of displaced families. 
However, in those early days, as usual, Queenslanders responded magnificently and were literally overwhelmed by the generosity as donations of all kinds poured in. Food, toys, clothes, everything dropped off. This alone was a huge task. One of the best examples of getting this all to work was in Gatton, where husband and wife team Derek and Chris Pingle and their small army set up what can best be described as a mini department store with no checkouts. People have been so generous, uh, it's overwhelming. I don't think I've ever seen uh, anything that has proven the true Australian spirit as much as it has for this effort. You know, we've had trucks and utilities and vans roll up here non-stop. Um, my phone rings every minute, more than once. So I have two phones and they ring every minute, every minute, every minute, someone bringing a donation and it's just non-stop. And, and to deal with the logistics of placing that product and then working out who needs what and what's going to be excess um, has been a mammoth task. I think it's going to be a really, really long process. They will start to realise those special occasions when people are no longer there or the special things in their life. But we can't put back those special things. We can meet their material needs, but I don't know who's going to meet all their emotional needs or how they're going to rebuild that part of their life. Major lessons were also learned in evacuation centres, like the Red Cross Centre in the badly hit northern city of Rockhampton. There are many people who have completely and utterly lost everything. Um, however, there are a great deal of people who haven't, but they've lost something. And whatever that something may be, it's very important to them and their lives. Everybody has their own journey and their own experience of an event such as this, and they're all equally important. But one of the things that's often overlooked is, is the total community response, the way in which the community itself reclaims a sense of its own rhythms, its own events, its own identity. And that can take months and months, if not years. Whilst justifiably, we've concentrated so far on the impact on homes and the residential community. However, the impact on the state's business community, large and small, can't be underestimated. As shown in the recent state budget, huge and long-term, the backbone of the state is the massive mining industry. And while the miners were quick to step up to the mark in the flood relief work, the impact on the industry itself was immense. What we saw in the recent floods, the two flood events, the one in the central Queensland in the coal fields and then the second one down here in Brisbane, was the industry really really contributing in a very major way. A huge amount of our own employees, uh, both in our time and in their time, volunteering to help, to sandbag old people's homes, to evacuate people, and then subsequently to clean out. People who go through these events um, take an awful long time to recover from it. And there's always still the fear that sort of sits at the back of people's minds, well, if it's happened once, it can happen twice. And uh, now we need to think very carefully about how we, how we help prepare people uh, on, an, on an ongoing basis. But I think that the contributions that have been made by organisations, companies, communities and individuals has just been absolutely first class. Coming up, how even those black clouds had a silver lining and how some major and sometimes painful lessons have been learned. If the huge rains and the dark clouds had a silver lining, it was to fill the vast water storages of northern and western Queensland to the brim and overflowing. The flooding might have been destructive and, as we know, tragically deadly, but it also brings to the outback a bounty of life as river systems long dry are flushed out and the bush blooms. After a good clean-out, even the local water sports club, long starved of their weekend recreation, were cleaning up and back having fun.
It was also time for a little bit of somewhat precarious, but it looked pretty good, fishing off the local dam spillway. But as the water roars over those spillways, the harsh reality sinks home to many local business people and many families that the scars of this year's disasters are going to take a long time to heal. Some people hadn't in fact moved back into their homes because we haven't got the, uh, the workmen out here and, and the people that, with the necessary skills to, to rebuild those houses. Um, and so, you know, that's ongoing. People think, oh yes, you know, I'll be back in my house and life goes on. It just doesn't happen that way. Let's go now to the most western winery in Queensland. The tiny boutique, but much admired River Sands Winery at St George. Here, where you'd least expect to find it, is a winery that produces fine and award-winning wines. A winery that was almost washed away. But in true spirit, pun intended, the business is up and running again. As Dana Gluds explains, it's not easy. As like all Queensland tourism, they were already doing it tough before the rains even came. Here at the vineyard, we're a dual industry vineyard. So we have wine grapes, which go into making our wine, and we also supply a table grape market. So unfortunately, we lost half our yields in both industries. Yeah, so Dana, the um, water got over my head here, about two metres of water mm. through here. Incredible, thank you. And uh, lo lots of mud and lots of dead vines. So all these old ones have got to be replaced. A lot of these young ones are buggered. Um, some may reshoot, but we don't know yet. So if we just show you one of these, I'll show you how you check them. You just have a look there. There's still a tiny bit of green there. It doesn't look real promising for that one. So in this block, I think we've got about 1,200 baby Shiraz, don't we? That we yeah, there's 12, potentially about need 1,200, so we'll probably have to replace most of them. Unfortunately, donations aren't, aren't actually going to sort of, you know, make it to many businesses and many tourism operators are dying for people to come back, you know. They may have been unaffected totally and so they're relying quickly on people to come back and show support and visit our beautiful area. As you can see on the way in, the vineyard's looking very luxurious despite, you know, 90% inundation. Queenslanders are great at, you know, exploration and going out and having a look at what's out west and there's no time to do it like, like now. We're proud of our country origins and we, we'd like to share that with people. And we'll drink to that. Overall though, the combination of the natural disasters, a soaring Aussie dollar and a tight-fisted domestic economy have been hard on the Queensland tourism industry. For them and us all, these are not the best of times. Let's leap forward now in time to June, when much of Queensland was gripped by a blast of freezing winter cold. However, as we rugged up and deluges and floods seemed to be the furthest things from our minds, our hearts were warmed by Queensland Week Awards, honouring some of those who represented the thousands who stepped up to the mark as heroes during those troubled times. Today we honour those who were strong when we needed strength. We honour those who were brave when we needed courage. Now stand so that we can salute you. Our disaster heroes, ladies and gentlemen. Heroes humbled as they accepted awards on behalf of their colleagues, friends and families for the roles they had played. It was really spine tingling and chilling, I guess, to, to, to feel um, such uh, emotion, you know, for, for recognition of what we did. In many cases, saving not just property, but lives in the dark days. Still to come, Queensland takes stock of one of the most tumultuous years in our state's short history. And how, sadly, already some people have begun to forget. It's now months later, and for most of Queensland, the physical scars, at least, have begun to fade. Here and there are reminders. It'll take years, not just months, 
for all of the wrath of Mother Nature to disappear completely. But the worst is gone. And for most people, the memories are just that. Memories that are already beginning to dim. For some, though, they remain vivid and haunting and will do so for a long, long time. Those are the people we must not forget. Whilst no one can question the enthusiasm and the skill of the many volunteers and the professionalism of many emergency service workers, so much so they've been praised on a world stage. However, questions have been justifiably raised about the conduct of relief work and response by some government agencies and insurance companies. Questions the Premier says will be addressed by the wide-ranging Commission of Inquiry, the findings of which she has vowed will not be left to gather dust on a government shelf. The Premier herself took centre stage during the crises. Not long after the worst was over, she sat quietly with us, not surrounded by uniforms, but in the quiet atmosphere of her executive office to reflect on what she admits was one of, if not the most challenging times of her career. I was daunted by the size of the task and the sense that I think everyone shared for a moment there that this was never going to end. It just seemed to go on and on and on. And every time we regrouped and felt we were moving to the next phase, something else would come and hit us. And that meant I had to find whatever it was inside myself uh, to keep going. And I saw people around me doing the same, out there day in, day out, giving people hope and confidence. And when you see other people around you doing it, you get, you get inspired by it as well. I felt in doing my job that I was standing on the shoulders of giants and those giants are the people in our emergency services front line. The effort here was uh, unprecedented, over an area unimaginable, and they did jobs that I think anyone else in the world would think impossible. I felt so proud of the men and women out there. I feel inspired by them and I feel very lucky we've got them. Uh, Mother Nature will always uh, surprise us and we won't be able to control it and that means we have to be ready and prepared but we also have to believe in ourselves and realise that we've done this before, we know how to do it uh, and if we do it right uh, we can come out of it stronger. Meanwhile in the far north the double whammy was brewing in the form of tropical cyclone Yasi. The giant storm was bearing down on the far north Queensland coast prompting evacuations, including that of Cairns Hospital, in a massive effort. Fortunately, at the last moment, it veered away, missing the major population centres. Not so fortunate were areas around Cardwell and Port Hinchinbrook, which took the full brunt of the storm. Wind, tidal surge and local flash flooding the bringers of massive destruction. Wiping some small coastal communities almost off the map. None of us thought it would be like this. We just thought a few trees would go down and it has taken everything. My son summed it up and said it's like sleeping on a trampoline because it, the building didn't stop shaking. The citizens of these towns took the warning seriously and acted accordingly and cooperated with great courage and resilience and patience is the reason so many of them are safe and well and alive this morning. I live at Mission Beach. We were the, one of the first crews through on uh, the morning after the cyclone. We were able to cut our way through from Mission Beach into Tully and uh, we were one of the first ones in the main street here to arrive and uh, see the damage. The store had been destroyed, the water was pouring in through the walls, the, the stock had all gone, the fixtures and fittings was uh, all totaled. To go to Innisfail. Uh, some mornings when you get out of bed and you just think, oh my God, where am I going to start today? Um, but generally looking forward in the long term, you know, you've got to maintain a positive outlook that 
uh, what we build after this will be better than what we lost. And, and I think that's the important thing, to, to keep seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and knowing that you're going to build something bigger, you're going to build something better, and uh, you'll, you'll be a part of this community for the long term. We need to remember that Queensland, like the rest of this vast nation we love and call home, is prone to droughts and flooding rains. That Queensland's main cities and towns, because of history and geography, are, for the most part, always going to be vulnerable for Mother Nature's wrath. However, if we're prepared, if we learn, if we do not forget, if we remember the spirit and the courage, we can come out at the end of the day muddied but unbound. Yeah.